Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the second episode of the 40 Orty podcast. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, Lorraine from the Chewy Gem Sensory Items for Autistics company. Uh, Lorraine, say hello. Hi. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Pretty good, yeah. Just a bit bit tired as usual. I yeah. think anyone who listens to my YouTube stuff and my podcast will know that I'm always tired. So, <laughs> well, in reality, that's just a an init- it's just a response, isn't it? Somebody asks you how you are, and you always say I'm fine, thank you. But in reality, you're probably not. No, it's just a <laughs> well, de- to it's some a, extent. You're, it, it's a it's default, a isn't it? Stale. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. But um, so I have had a little bit of a sort of back and forth with the company. I think I did like. For my YouTube channel, I did did sort of a a review video. He sent me like a box of sensory items and stuff to have a look on my channel and stuff. And since then, I have been on your podcast, the Sensory Matters podcast. Yeah, I really enjoyed your and podcast, actually. <laughs> did you? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> oh, it's hard. To, oh, jeez. <clears throat> oh, I'm the Bit same. Cough. I'm the same. I had a cough <laughs> and a cold, and it's just all coming out now. Uh, so do you want to give everybody a little bit of a background on who you are who Lorraine is Uh, so yeah I'm Lorraine I'm 37 years old and I've got two kids both who are autistic and I didn't know that I was autistic until the first one started to go through their diagnosis and we've come a long way since then Jamie's going to be 16 next week and so yeah so there's three of us in the family autistic and I do Chewy Jam. I just kind of run the community. That's my main focus, interacting so with you, people and helping people. So you do like all the kind of social media stuff and um, taking messages and am I right? Like, that Yeah, kind of thing? I mean, we, we've started to grow, grow because we've been going now for, I think this is our 10th year. So we're, we are growing, you know, we've got some more staff. So I'm not doing as much social media as I did, but I try and do a lot of the content and try to answer as many messages as I can, because I think it's important that when people message a company, there's an actual person at the end. Yes. So yeah, and a lot of people know, well, you know, message them, you'll probably get Lorraine. And if you don't get Lorraine, you can always ask for Lorraine and, and then I'll answer. Cool. Awesome. And um, I was just going to say, like, it's it's quite interesting that you you mentioned. What when did you find out that you you were autistic? Did you just sort of go along to get the diagnoses and sort well, of think about it, or for a while, I kind of ummed and ahed in my own head because I was going through the process with um, my first child, and I kept thinking, oh, you know, we're very similar. This is very much like me. So <laughs> when I finally agreed in my own brain that probably. I was autistic as well. I started to make notes on my phone of all my traits. And every time something was quite obvious, I would make a note. So I did that for about two years. And then I I couldn't decide whether it was important to have a diagnosis or not, because a lot of people are self-diagnosed and they don't need the actual diagnosis. But I got to the point where I really needed to know for sure. Yes. So I went to the GP and asked for a referral. And it was very difficult because they didn't want to refer me because they don't understand why an adult would want a diagnosis. But I got my referral um, and I was actually diagnosed in, what month are we in now? October. So it would have been July. All right. So you're part of the uh, the little autism team then, are you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite funny, actually, because the last guy that I had on, a, a, a dude called Guy, and um, he was sort of in the process of getting his uh, child a diagnosis and stuff and he's realized the same thing so there seems to be a little bit of a trend like well i also going through through my diagnosis once you're diagnosed i live in in cumbria you get three follow-up appointments after diagnosis okay. to kind of help you to learn with social communication and things that you might struggle with and they're giving me an autism passport and 
I realise I'm actually a lot more autistic than I ever even thought because <laughs> <laughs> the things that come up in those sessions, I'm like, oh yeah, because I just think everybody's like me. Yes, yeah. And then and it's, it's like, it, yeah, no, you think completely different to them, and that that's <laughs> not how people think. <laughs> no, it's 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 always well. I mean, if I suppose everybody to some extent does that. Everybody thinks they're everyone's on the same wavelength, and that it's sometimes hard to know what is normal and what isn't yeah um there is sort of a general sort of norms but nobody really discusses what those are in general so yeah uh but that's very interesting and uh i think you know due to autism being quite hereditary um there's there's a large kind of genetic component to it um there was this guy that i in me in university Um, I did like a final year project. I made a documentary and there's this guy called Peter Bainbridge who runs Salford Autism. And he says that whenever he goes, he sort of mediates families with members of the public. So if a student who's on the spectrum has difficulty with a landlord, they will, um, he will sort of step in and try and mediate a little bit. That's good. And he has said on 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 this documentary that every time he goes in to like a family household to if it's family dispute or or anything like that there is always sort of aspects of autism in the parents of the autistic child (laughs) yeah i've noticed that just at groups and things as i as the years have gone along and i've met different families and i would say that usually you can see which parent it comes from (laughs) and then i can see it in my own mother and then i can see it in her father Mm mm-hmm you just follow the trail, yeah. follow the trail down, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so let's get into the the grit of it. What is it that you offer at Chewy Gem, like as a, as an overview, sort of? So Chewy Gem is chewable mm-hmm. jewelry, fidgets, and stim toys, um, just to provide people with something safe that they can chew on because chewing is a stim, and mm-hmm. it started off as a product but now it's much more about the community and that's where I focus most of my time. So it's just bringing people together because I don't know if you feel the same, but when you meet other autistic people, you kind of feel at home. Yes. Yeah. You feel like you can sort of be a bit more movie around and stim without feeling, feeling like people are judging you. Yeah. And you seem to get each other and Mm -hmm. yeah, I just think our community, it's really important to interact with the community so that's mainly, and we do have the product, you know, on the website, run, you know, you can go on the website, you can order the product, but basically I'm, I'm in the community, I'm in the Chewy Gem Sensory Support Group and on the main page, just chatting and helping people and, and meeting other autistic adults as well for me has been really amazing. In what way? Just that, because I, I thought everybody was like me, but at the same time I knew everybody wasn't like me because mm-hmm. I struggled in social, social situations. And when I've met other autistic adults, I feel like I can be myself. Mm -hmm. So it's been really nice to meet other people, especially like things like the autism show in Birmingham when we we go down there and meet other people that are very similar to myself. I just feel kind of like I can just relax and take that mask off completely. Mm -hmm. And it's the same in the community. I I do think that that is quite a big um, component of autistic communities because I know that... People in general are very understanding if you ask them, you know, I'm like, does stimming look weird or, or anything like that. But from my experiences is that even if someone knows that you're autistic, but they don't really get it, I have sort of had a a few like weird looks and, and all that. So I've sort of bounced between not stimming at all to doing too much of it and feeling, feeling sort of weird and isolated and people looking at me weird yeah and I think, I think as an adult as well I find it easier to channel stimming into something that looks more socially acceptable yes exactly that's and that's the kind of thing that that I do like right yeah. now nowadays and I was quite surprised at how much because I, I did that trial shift I, I had to go with some of the items I quite liked the the little bracelet the sort yeah. of camouflagey black bla- bracelet yeah. And I found that it quite it helped quite a lot. 
just a yeah. little bit just See, a I, little bit just uh yeah i find that like before i was diagnosed i was a bit unsure of whether i should really explore things like stim toys and like i did things in my own house because i was comfortable by myself mm-hmm. but now that i've got the diagnosis i feel that i can explore my senses a lot more so mm-hmm. i'm i'm doing things that i've always wanted to do but i've always been a little bit too nervous to do so like teddy bears and toys and things like going back to my youth yeah and before I would have been really shy and embarrassed and I, I wouldn't want to be judged for doing that where now I'll just go and buy if I see a teddy bear I'll just buy it because I want it <laughs> I just, yeah I just feel like I can do <laughs> what, what yeah. I need to do I I do I have kept a lot of my my um sort of teddies and stuff from when I was younger yeah I really like uh I think one one of the things that's a really big sort of stimming thing for me was a trampoline. Right. And I used to I used to sort of go into the backyard after school and just bounce away all the stress from the days. Yeah. And it just seemed to help. I used to do this thing where <laughs> Do you know when you do like a backdrop on a trampoline? Yeah. And you sort of fall down and you you bounce. Well, I managed to get it so I could just stay on my back and I'd sort of like kick my legs up. Wow. <laughs> And just bounce on my back. Yeah. <laughs> and that thinking, seems... Yeah, I'm thinking back to school because I didn't have a trampoline, but we did do trampoline at school. And I'm thinking oh. back to it now and how much I really enjoyed that bouncing yeah. up and down. Yeah, it's it just really feels re- good. It's regulated, it just... isn't it? It's really mm. regulated. Very repetitive. Yeah. You know when you're going to bounce, you know the the motion and stuff. Because I'm, I'm very hypersensitive and my, I've got quite bad vestibular hypersensitivity so I'm really clumsy yeah and um it means means that I don't really get much of the sensory aspect of movement but right. if it's like intense so if it's a bounce or if it's like a roller coaster or spinning so I used to spin in the in the living room when I was watching tv which was very annoying for my parents but <laughs> yeah. I really liked it and it it really calms me down and I sort of wish that I didn't get rid of that because now I just feel silly doing it and even in even in private yeah I I know what you mean see my eldest child is a pacer so imagine the coffee table and Jamie's just pacing around in circles and circles and circles obviously it's really regulating for Jamie but my husband gets really nervous about it because he can't understand why it's happening yeah uh, but I you must think there's something really wrong or yeah and I don't want him to say right stop pacing why are you pacing because I want Jamie to continue to do whatever Jamie needs to do to be able to regulate yes that's a really I think that's a really important aspect of it uh, and that that's kind of kind of what you do at True Jam isn't it you give I think even for would you say that you marketed mostly towards sort of parents or children would that be when we first started, I would say it was more parents of autistic children, but as we've grown, we've definitely got a lot more teens and autistic adults. So it's mm-hmm. really for everybody. Um, recently, we've had a lot of older women, which is really fantastic because I think there's this misgeneration of women that mm-hmm. didn't get diagnosed because they're masked their whole lives and now they're, they're diagnosed. When I was at the autism show, I actually did a sensory clinic. I had quite a lot of autistic females come in that had recently been diagnosed and they just want to explore themselves. And it's as if they've missed out on the last 40 years. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's like we've got something for everybody. That's brilliant. And I, I definitely did find that the thing that I tried was very, very discreet. It looked like a normal band, but I could just chew it. Yeah, and, and we've got a mix. We've I've got, got some... a really... Sorry, go, go on. on. <laughs> we've got like some really fun and funky, like proper out there stuff because some people yeah. want to show it off, but then we've got some discreet stuff for those who don't want people to know. Mm-hmm. And I have tried my very hardest to bite through that bracelet and I've got a really strong jaw and I just, I can't. I can't yeah. make a dent in it. It's really good. Um, So why did you... Why did you start Chewy, Chewy Gem? Why did the company sort of come off the ground? What was the ethos behind it? Uh, yeah. Well, it's based on Jamie, who's my eldest child, um, going through diagnosis. Jamie was diagnosed with dyspraxia first. When we saw a speech language therapist, they mentioned about chewing. I just thought it was like an extension of teething originally. And I just kind of, you know, went with it, wet jumpers, holes in jumpers. 
and the speech and language therapist said you can buy something called jewelry so i googled it and really there was only canada and america that had anything so i ordered some in it was very expensive it wasn't i'm afraid i don't understand oh. Google's going off. <laughs> you don't need to understand Siri or Alexa. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but, um, don't distract us. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't quite what I wanted. So I mm-hmm. started, and now I realise that this was one of my special interests. I then started searching and searching and searching because I knew there had to be something out there that was exactly what I wanted. It had to exist. So I was just on the internet constantly trying to find something. Then I found Gummy Gem, which was teething necklaces for mums to wear and babies to chew and they just looked like normal jewellery and I thought you know I'll give those a try ordered one and it was fantastic so I then contacted the CEO of Gummy Gem explained why I'd bought their product and how amazing it was for people with sensory difficulties and then from there Jenny who's the owner was like well would you like to work with us and we can set up a sister company and that's what we did brilliant so You saw a gap in the market. You pounced on it. (laughs) (laughs) It was very slow. (laughs) It sounds 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 quite aggressive me saying like that, but you you found some some way of helping people. Yeah, for me, it was like I'd I'd hit the jackpot, and I needed other people to know about it. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Cool. And what really was the process of setting up Chewy Gem? Because you already had the. The yeah, gummy, the gummy gem, gem thing sort of already there. What? Yeah. How did you change your marketing? What What kind of things did you do to get it out there? Well, for for me, it was about social media networking. Obviously, we had gummy gems, so we already had the products. Um, at the time, we were really small, so everything was getting sent out from Jenny's kitchen table. So they were doing all the the picking and packing. So everything was there. We just needed the website, and then to get social media going and networking, and just get people aware of our products so that's where I worked on social media and it was really slow going for a long time because people weren't using Facebook the same way as they do now Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah it was just for me it was I just put a lot of time and effort into joining other groups and meeting other people that had the same needs as we did and just trying to to get people to know that we were there Mm mm-hmm just chatting with people. Yeah, a lot of it was chatting and going to, if there was any events anywhere, just to sort of hand out my card and network. Cool. Uh, it's, it's, I, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that really sort of surprises a lot of people is, is when autistic people are very good and active in, in socialising because it sort of goes against the grain of what everybody thinks it's like. Yeah. Would you agree? Like, Well, I was just saying this to my husband the other day. If I need to make a phone call, if somebody phones me, I ignore my phone or I don't make the phone call. But I've worked as a secretary. I've worked as a receptionist. I've worked in customer services. And if I'm that person, if I'm the customer services advisor, I can make that phone call and I can answer that phone, no problem at all. But as yes. me, it's really difficult. <laughs> So it's kind of like you've got you've got two modes, and once you switch on the other mode, yeah, I suppose you it's like work. acting. Yeah, it's like you you are playing mm. a role because it takes energy, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It takes a lot of energy. So yeah, if you have to work, learn how to articulate them and what not to say, what to say, what are the the hidden things that you're missing? There's a lot of ambiguity with talking to chiefly talking to neurotypical people i've found yeah that, um, autistic people it's a lot more straightforward yeah, and easy that's why i like our community so much because it is so much easier to speak to them yeah <laughs> and i i have you know tried to um you know with with my my youtube channel asperger's growth i've tried to get get the name out there and, and talk to people as much as i can and I think one of the main benefits for me, because when I started off, it was mostly as sort of a venting platform for me to explain, you know, the difficulties that I'm having yeah. at the start. But now as, as I've got, as I've got older and as I've built up a, a little community on YouTube, it's really nice just to talk to people. If it's just like one or two cents, one or two paragraphs exchanged yeah. in the comments. It gives you an idea of 
what life is like and, and what other people's experiences are sort of pushes you forward, doesn't it? Like, Definitely. And I think it's really important for people like you that have got YouTube channels, autistic adults, because parents of autistic children have got somewhere to go to find out what it's like as an adult and ways yeah. that they might be able to help their children because you can mm-hmm. voice it where their child can't voice it. Yeah, and there is a lot of difficulties being autistic in childhood, a lot of a lot of problems. And if you can't really like explain or, or get put yourself in their shoes, it's very hard to work with them, I yeah. think. And that the main thing is, is that firstly, you know, they'll know, they'll know what to do. They'll know what doesn't help. They'll know how to use their words, how to be direct. Yeah. And secondly, they can realize there's, there's some parents who don't particularly feel good about the future for their child if they haven't sort of been been around autistic people a lot and seeing seeing people on the spectrum succeeding i think is one of the best things about social media and, and getting yourself out there yeah definitely because they totally can think with hey look my my son my son's daughter is has Asperger's or has autism and yeah. look what these autistic and people you know yeah See, people Jamie, on the spectrum have done Jamie my eldest child's going to be 16 on Wednesday um mm-hmm. and they're quite involved in Chewy Gem with live videos and things not so much at the moment because we've been having some school issues but what I like is that Jamie will go and do a live video and then parents will come on and say how similar their children are and they're really yeah. thankful that they've seen this because now they know that as their child grows, they'll they know that they'll be able to achieve certain things. And so that is that is very valuable. Yeah. It's very valuable. I don't think there's I think there's a lot of utility and sort of smashing smashing the stigmas and over overcoming sort of the, the there's gotta be a very fine balance between knowing what they they can do when trying to sort of approach things in a sort of a graded exposure way rather than just sort of throwing them into it and not being, yeah, oh God, I'm not putting that across and I very think well. It's, sort of finding a fine line between. You yeah. Know. And I think it's really important to always consider mental health because I've, what, uh, my youngest child is a, a school refuser, really struggles with school. And whilst mm-hmm. on paper, he should go to school and get GCSEs and A-levels and get a really good job. That doesn't mean that that's actually what he's going to achieve. And if I keep pushing him into that situation, it's just going to affect his mental health. And he might end mm-hmm. up getting no GCSEs, no A-levels. Where So I'm at the point now where I'm thinking, well, what's better for him? Would he be better in yeah. a more specialist environment where maybe he got five GCSEs rather than 11? Mm-hmm. Because it will be better for him in the long run for his mental health. Yeah, I, I think what one of the the difficulties in sort of disseminating information about it is that every person is different. Every autistic person is different, and you know, some what while some autistic people can have high levels of anxiety, mm-hmm. others can be pretty fine, just going about what they're doing and not really caring about what other people think, and that's that's okay for some people and. It's always got to be tailored, doesn't it? And you really got to get inside the mind of your child yeah. or other autistic people to give them the best support. Yeah. And going on to the, the next question, what are sensory needs? And is fulfilling them important for autistic individuals? now that we're on the topic of support? Uh, Well, sensory processing difficulties, that's when the brain has trouble receiving and responding to information that comes through the senses. Um, Actually, there's one in 20 people will suffer with sensory processing difficulties and they may not be autistic people. It is commonly associated Mm -hmm. that autistic people will have sensory processing difficulties, but there's a lot of other people that will also have sensory processing difficulties that aren't autistic. So I think it's Mm -hmm. important that we fulfil everybody's need when it comes to sensory difficulties um i've got quite an opinion on things in schools and sensory toys and 
you know, some schools don't allow them. And I just think that every child is so different. So whether they're autistic or not, if they need something to help regulate them in school, I don't see why we're not doing that. No. And it's it's further just, it's trying to mask what autism is from other people as well. Because kids are very understanding at, at that age if you explain it to them. Yeah. Um, the other children, you know, around the autistic children yeah, or the people with sensory teachers, issues. Yeah, because a lot of teachers, they'll say, oh, he can't have that because all the children in the class will want that. But that's not the case. Like you say, a lot of children are really understanding. So if from the get-go you go into the class and you say little Timmy needs a chewy gem and this is why, then the children understand much the same as if somebody needs a wheelchair or glasses or a hearing aid. Mm-hmm. If it you just need to explain to learn, it to them. Yeah. Yeah. And they are very receptive to that. That's one thing that I found is that if you explain things to people, just people in general, yeah, um, in a way that they sort of resonate with to some degree, you know, with the right examples and comparisons, it does work. Yeah. Not with everybody. There's always going to be some people who are a bit, you know, skeptical and they don't really understand it. Yeah. But for most people... And I Definitely think, something that I've found. I think that's why it's important for autistic adults to be out there and doing things like this because we're created a platform for people to access information. So mm-hmm. this is like this podcast, for example, would be great for teachers to listen to. Yes. And I think that's really important that we're doing things like this because it helps children and it helps other adults. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is the What are the benefits of fulfilling these sensory needs? Well, it's self-regulation, so people stim to regulate their sensory system. Um, I'll try and give an example. I'll use school as an example. So little kids at school have carpet time, you know, where you go and have your story at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So the teacher's there and all the kids are sat on the carpet and they're listening to the story. And then there's that kid that can't sit still, bouncing around. And they're like, sit down, sit down. But they don't give them anything to regulate themselves. So the movement is their self-regulation. That's their stimming. So you can use a sensory toy. It doesn't even have to be a sensory toy. It can be anything, anything that's going to channel their self-regulating. So like blue tack, um, pipe cleaners are brilliant. Something that just occupies them to self-regulate so that they can sit down and access that carpet time. Yeah. And that's it's the same in any situation so I've used that as an example just because I know there are a lot of um, younger kids who struggle with things like that and it is as simple as giving them say if they're a chewer giving them a chewy gem um, some teachers will say the chewy gems are distracting I don't know if you've ever had this that people think you're not listening to them because you're not looking at them or you're doing something else oh yes but actually <laughs> too, too often yeah actually too often <laughs> like I could be on my phone I'm not necessarily on my phone like I'm not trying to someone I'm just doing something that it means that I can listen better. And yes. people might think I'm rude, but actually I'm taking more in by doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, where a lot, it's... yeah, you get, you get, you get told that you're rude because you've not looked at someone or you're rude because you're on your phone or you're rude because um, you're chewing or like for me, for my child, Jamie, um, rude for being on the iPad where actually if I'm talking to Jamie, Jamie hears everything I say whilst on the iPad. But if I said, look at me, listen to me, they wouldn't have a clue what I've said because they can't no, focus. They're trying to look at you, yeah, and it's difficult. It's that's it's something that I've that I've found in a lot of different situations. Um, if I feel compelled to look at someone in the eyes, so if it's for like a job interview, I know that eye contact sometimes. Well, it it does help a lot with that kind of thing, and the more that I try my best to look at somebody in the eyes the more that my brain just gets distracted from that task. Yeah, and do you feel so like you're staring at them? Cause oh, I'm, yeah, I feel horrible for it. Yeah. I feel like I'm trying to – I feel like I'm being in a really bad person. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, I try – Because that's how I feel when people look at me like that. Yeah, see, I've so. got this thing. So, like, back in school, you know, the teachers, when they're like, look at me, look at me. So, mm-hmm. in my head, I think I must look at people. So, I stare at people, and then I'm staring at them and thinking, I need to look away, but I don't know how to look away now. And it's just, I just feel so uncomfortable. So it's a lot of mind sort of, your mind sort of tries to attack the problem. And it's like, oh, I need to do that. I need to do that. And then you forget what they're saying. You find yourself zoning out from it because you're just trying to concentrate. Yeah. 
and it that's happened to me even in like because I used to be a an athlete when I was younger used to be when I was a teenager and I did taekwondo and it's a combat sport so eye contact is usually sort of one of the main rules of you know sparring with someone fighting with somebody yeah and I, I just can't concentrate if I'm trying to look at someone's eyes like so I it was something that my coach has told me to do and stuff but whenever I try it I just find myself concentrating more on trying to look at them than actually fighting yeah and it's not very good especially if you're in such like a high pressure and dangerous scenario <laughs> so did that affect you not being able to do the eye contact in, in taekwondo so I when when I went up to the ring when it, when I was sort of walking out I would make eye contact at the start so I would you know just for the sounds a bit mean but just for the intimidation value yeah if that makes sense <laughs> it sounds horrible but it's, it's part you kind of have to do it? that kind of thing yeah and then as soon as I fight I look I don't look anywhere I just look into the distance and for some reason that helped yeah because nobody knew what I was doing yeah because usually people look where they're going to kick but I don't so that that was quite a I think that was sort of an advantage for me maybe that's what helped me in netball when I was younger <laughs> maybe through you know, yeah through where I wasn't looking mm. yeah I think that's quite a good a nice little skill nice little hidden skill yeah. in the autistic mind <laughs> Um, so do you think there is any stigmas around sensory difficulties or fulfilling those sensory needs? I don't know if I'd say there were stigmas. I think, again, it's lack of understanding. I think Mm -hmm. the world is getting better. People are becoming more understanding, but we've still got a long way to go. I think, like with the schools... And I think it's important because schools, that's where the young people are and these kids are going to grow up to be autistic adults. So if at school, a school isn't willing to let a child stim or self-regulate and they're trying to stop it, then that child's going to learn to compress their sensory issues. And and alleviate it in other ways, yeah. which is probably not very healthy, yeah. which I know that is a problem like alcohol abuse and substance abuse yeah. is quite and that's where thing like, that I've read about. A lot of, a lot of kids at school are coming across that there's there's no issues and then they come home and they explode at home because that's where yes, they feel yeah. that they can do that because at school they've tried so hard to compress everything and do as they're told and fit in that it's got to come out somewhere. Mm-hmm. And that that's that's something that I've my my mum's a sensory uh sensory needs teacher. <laughs> <laughs> a special needs teacher and when she talks to parents and stuff, that seems to be quite a, a common occurrence. They, and some parents, they think that home is stressing them out when they come back from school. Yeah. That's that's one of the, that's completely like the wrong way to think about it. Yeah, and I think it, some schools it? will say, oh, well, you must be doing something at home, what's happening at home. And it's not that, it's just mm-hmm. that that's the safe place. That's where they feel that they can then let everything out. Because that, yeah. that's what I had with and my And it does son. help. Yeah, my, my youngest, he he masks at school. And the paediatrician that we saw for his diagnosis said, I'm not sure if school are going to tell me the full story here because what they are seeing is just one side of him. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And obviously being being a parent, you, you have a bit more of a intimate relationship with your child. It's just a given. Um, and so you'd be able to, you'd, you'd be able to pick up on the, the problems and some sometimes people can be can listen to the teachers too much and and especially when it's teachers who don't have an understanding of autism yeah um you i cannot stress the importance to anyone listening that you need to find somewhere where there is someone who honestly understands it like who understands how autistic people work, some of the the main problems and how to combat it and some of the sort of things that are quite misdirecting, like as we've talked about, um, coming home and having a meltdown. It seems like that 
that home would be the problem for most children yeah. if they're having getting stressed at home but it's not is it it's just not being able to get rid of that nervous energy yeah and i've got this thing where say at secondary school you've got six lessons and I, mm-hmm. I'm really struggling to get my son into school at the moment. And it's maybe because something's happened in French, for example. So tomorrow he won't go because he's got French. Well, I think, why not let him not do French? And it's not that I'm letting him get away with French. It's just that at least then he's going to do five periods at school. And then maybe he does that one period in, in inclusion, just so that he's still in that school and he's still in the environment rather than being off for the whole day and then look at other ways of working back into the French lesson. Yeah. So that's what I'm, I'm trying that's... with him at the minute. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because... Other... How's that going? Um, school have been quite good. They've been quite helpful. Um, yeah, it's up and down. If if I get him in, he's, he's fine. I think it's that initial anxiety of going to school. Once he's there, he then tends to get into the swing of it. But yeah, I'm just trying to to explain to school that if he misses out on one thing like PE for example it's not that he doesn't like PE but it's quite a stressful lesson for him because it's loud and there's a lot of people so I don't see why he always has to do PE because he'll miss that whole day because he knows it's a PE day if there was Mm -hmm. something else in place I've even said before I'll come to school and like take him for a walk for an hour so he's still getting physical exercise but yeah, I just think it's important to focus on the the, the things that, that a child's strong at doing, what they enjoy, and then work from there. Working around the problem. Yeah. And trying to gr- graded exposure. Yeah, and this is what <laughs> I was saying about the 11 GCSEs compared to the five, and this is where I'm struggling now, is that he only wants to do the lessons that he feels comfortable in. Mm-hmm. Um, so it makes it a real struggle for all the rest of the lessons. And because it's a mainstream school and he doesn't get any support, it's really difficult. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have like, do they have like a special needs unit or anything in the school? Uh, no, they do have a learning, deport, uh, learning support department, but he doesn't access that at the minute. Um, so my other child is in a autism specialist school, which is fantastic. Yeah. So the difference is it's like night and day, but it's just mm-hmm. that there's not I- enough places for everybody. I have I have been into a special needs school um, recently. They call it SEN, don't they? Yeah. SEN schools. Uh, this one in Rochdale called uh, Redwood Secondary School, and I was just I was I was just amazed at how happy all of the children are. <laughs> well, all the time. I just think that all schools should have an ASD unit because yeah. all schools yeah. have got ASD kids. Mm-hmm. So why not just have they that do. little place where they can go if they need to? Uh, we did have a local school, and that's where Jamie was going to go originally, and then they closed down the ASD unit and just said, no, it's mainstream school. So in the end, Jamie went, uh, where in Cumbria, Jamie ended up going to Liverpool Residential for three years because that was the only school that could accommodate the need. Now we've got this yeah. new autism academy, which has opened. It's been open for three weeks um, locally. And oh, it's, it's just absolutely amazing. It's just... And do you find that his learning is enhanced by this environment? Um, I don't know, because being nearly 16, Jamie still doesn't want to go to school. It's very much that teenage <laughs> yeah, stuff. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but it's just how bespoke the school is to each child. And having spoken to some of yeah. the other parents, it's like there's no pressure. Um, if they don't do any lessons, the whole point is to get them into school between nine and three and them not be anxious and then they'll work from there. So I just think the whole the whole the whole way that they're doing it is perfect. That's brilliant. Um I've had this this conversation before, but uh you know, like the the, the debate between mainstream and SEN schools. Uh I think that I think that SEN schools are very, very useful for um certain certain children yeah i think some i think it's it's more about whether an, an autistic child can handle mainstream school yeah because there, there are some benefits to it in terms of meeting not so nice people meeting nice people learning how to interact with 
neurotypicals. Yeah, and just becoming resilient and knowing how life works. Yes, yeah. yeah. But I, I, I don't know where that, where that line crosses over to considering a, an SEN school. Because I, I had a horrible time in mainstream school due to bullying and isolation and not feeling like anybody really understood me. Mm-hmm. We did have a special needs unit, but it was, it was more for kids who were a little bit behind yeah. on school and they had to go in, sort of do, do some one-to-one sessions to try and catch up with the, the rest of the classes. Yeah. And they didn't help me with what they said. The only thing that I found very helpful was they informed all of my teachers that if I need a break, if I'm getting overloaded, I'm allowed to leave the lesson and just go chill in there and possibly have a meltdown in there. (laughs) Yeah, this is what I'm trying to fight for for Joe, my youngest, because um, not all of the teachers know because he only got his diagnosis in the summer holidays. So I'm trying to tell the school, can you like filter it down throughout all of his lessons? so that the teachers know, Mm -hmm. but I was still at the point where they don't really know, or some of them who might think that, no, he's not, because he does just go into class and do as he's told. Yeah. That there's, there's quite a disconnect because some, some people think that they understand autism. Um, The teachers, some, some teachers think that they've got it all figured out and stuff, but it's only, it's only when, they have experience and an, an intimate experience with an autistic person that they really understand what it's about. Yeah. Um, it's, and I, th- if, I think the whole, it's especially someone who talks about it. Yeah. I think the whole special education school. So I'm thinking back to when I was at school, cause I'm 37. So it's a, you know, quite a while ago when I was in mainstream secondary, I hated school. I used to avoid going to school where, where possible, apart from the lessons that I really enjoyed where the teachers were really nurturing and helpful. So mm-hmm. history, English, German, and I can't think now. Um, but those three, definitely, the teachers were really understanding with me and really helpful. So when I was struggling, they would really help me. And I did really well in my GCSEs for those subjects. And I went to school for those subjects. Yeah. And I wonder if I got the same help and support in other subjects, if I would have enjoyed them more and done better. Yeah, because we learn in a very different way and we need... Sometimes we need teachers to come over and explain stuff in sort of excruciatingly intense detail yeah, and, for, us to, and I think the for us to get it in our heads. Processing time as well. When a teacher stands up in front of a class and says, duh, 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 and all the kids get that and start to work and you're sat there still trying to catch up on what they've just said. Yeah. Yeah. And you need a bit of, you need someone to listen to you. That's like the main thing. I just found that if someone is willing to listen to you and take on board what you're saying, it helps like so much. Definitely. Some of the best best people that I've known in my life have no autism training or experience with autistic people at all. And that the the only the only way that they the the way that the thing that makes me drawn to them is just that they're kind yeah. and they listen to me. And they smile, yeah. And they try and help if we've got a problem, yeah. rather than sit back, judge. You know, say you just been over melodram, over dramatic and silly. Yeah. It's really important to have that aspect of it. Yeah, and I think, and I think everybody in the world is different, and that's why understanding people are, are really, really good because you, you feel more comfortable with somebody that's understanding. Yes, yeah. You don't feel like you're trying to walk on eggshells or yeah. or glass, yeah. probably, <laughs> as it feels like for us the intense anxiety of social interaction. <laughs> um. So yeah. Uh. Next question: What can society do to accommodate sensory difficulties and the autistic people who have them? Right. So I think. People are trying really hard with autism-friendly screenings and autism shopping hours and soft play sessions, but they all seem to be on a Sunday morning 
between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. And Mm -hmm. most autistic people really struggle with sleep. So being up and ready at 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning to do any of these things is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. And then during these autism-friendly hours, I think they bring the music down and they bring the lights down, and that's great. But what if all of the time, instead of, so say say your music level is on nine and the lights are on level nine, but for the autistic friendly hours, you bring them down to three. Why not always have them mm-hmm. on six? So yeah. that everybody can access things all of the time. Mm-hmm. Like why does music in a shop have to be so loud? I'm pretty sure that even if you weren't autistic and you didn't have sensory issues, that that music's still too loud. Definitely. Definitely. It's not It's not the most relaxing environment, is it, for anybody? No. And I personally do most of my shopping online. Yeah, it's easier, isn't so it? So just easier. type in what you want. Sometimes you get the wrong items, but it's convenient. It, if you buy enough, it doesn't cost anything, yeah. <laughs> depending on where you get it from. So it's just like a no-brainer. Yeah. Really. But I think things like the Sunflower Lanyard Scheme are really good because um, I know Sainsbury's and Tesco's have rolled it out as well now. So if somebody's in there with a sunflower lanyard, I would imagine, say it was really busy at the tills, they would maybe open another till so that they could get through quicker. I think things like that, because mm. because you can't see if somebody's autistic, that somebody doesn't look autistic. You get that all the time. Don't they? Oh, but you don't look autistic. No, you don't look autistic. So the sunflower lanyard, for example, brings it to the attention of the staff in the shop. That yeah. you might just need a little bit of help. Mm-hmm. I, I think that, there's a lot of things that are being put in place um, to tr- to try and remedy it, but I I I sort of feel like I don't feel like they are really getting to the core of the issue. They're just trying to do some small things to get attention for themselves or to appease it in a little yes. bit. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, sometimes I think it is about publicity. Like if somebody puts an autism friendly hour on, it's because they want everybody to know that they've done that. But again, it's not... Yeah, they're helping autistic yeah, people. And, and how do they police it? Like, how do they know that it's only autistic people that are going? And does it only have to be autistic mm-hmm. people that are going? It's just really... It doesn't really make sense. It's not It's not thought through properly, I don't think. Where I think if... No, and the 9am to 10am thing is absolutely absurd. I don't know how... I, I don't know about you, but I would really struggle to do that Definitely. a lot. <laughs> See, I know that my local 24-hour Tesco's is really quiet at like 9 or 10 at mm-hmm. night. So I would just, if I was going to go, I'd probably go at that time anyway. Like yeah. I would never go places that I know are going to be busy at certain times. Mm-hmm. I do, but I just struggle with yeah, it see, i live in a really small <laughs> i put myself through it i live in a really small <laughs> rural place so there's never really <laughs> any danger of going somewhere busy ah. what, what so yeah where whereabouts in in cumbria because i'm terrible at geography it's not my favorite subject uh, so but... i live in a little market town called egremont which is near whitehaven and workington and then probably about an hour and a bit from carlisle which is our nearest city but where I am, it's just mm-hmm. yeah, just a little place with fields and not many shops, just like your local post office yeah. and things like that. So yeah, it's it's not a busy place. It's quite nice. Kind of like Harrogate. Um, I've never been to Harrogate actually. Would you say? Um, Have you not? No. We, oh wow! And I, I nearly ended up working in Harrogate, but I've never actually been. Houses are difficult, but yeah. <laughs> It is a really, it is a really lovely place. I only really realised that until I went away to uni in Manchester for four years or well, three years. Yeah. Then I, then I appreciate the the fields and the quiet and the just like lack of people everywhere yeah. and the buses. I, it's it's so much more of a calming environment just to have all those sentry. Things. Yeah, like where I live, it just toned down a little bit. If you got bit. on a bus here, you wouldn't have to worry about standing. They're never that busy. <laughs> yeah, I hate standing up. It's like, where do you yeah. look? Where? Do... <laughs> That's one of the most difficult sort of social situations for me. It's just what where what you're supposed to do because there's no like set rules for this. It's not like it's a 
social interaction with your friend because you know that you're going to be talking about your day and what how things have been going but so I, it's just the subtle yeah, things I, keep scripts in my that head I struggle with for different situations yeah me too and because of what yeah you? and because of where i live it's like i know who's going to be behind the counter in the shop for example because it's such a small community so i've got to know what they will ask me or what i should ask them yeah. Um, yeah. So I've got these li- little scripts, and I know I walk the dog at a certain time. I know exactly which people are going to pass me, what their dogs are called. So it's like all in my head, ready to go if they speak to me. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I do. I don't think anybody's. You no, know, sort of. I I thought that was just something that I did, but no. Well, <laughs> I do that, and um, when I was going through my assessment, the psychologist said, "Well, that's like routine. That's your routine." And I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't routine, think about it yeah. like that." But yeah, it's like if I'm at the bus stop, I, I kind of know what I'm going to say because it's usually like an old man or an old woman who's waiting for the bus. So it's usually like, how's the weather? You know, that sort of conversation. I've got them all in my brain. I know who says what and how to answer. <laughs> That's cool. It's it's usually, for me, it's usually about um, if I'm going somewhere that there is a possibility that someone confronts me in a not so nice manner. That's usually where I get all my scripts from. Um, it never happens. I was going to say, I, I to couldn't be imagine honest, being confronted but... in a not nice manner, but I suppose where I live, it's very unlikely to happen where I hear about things in like bigger cities. Yeah, so yeah. Are you, you're in Manchester now. No, I, I'm How back in Harrogate. I finished my uni degree. I went, did three years at Manchester and one year in Thailand, oh. in Chiang Mai. Uh, so there were very, very sort of busy places yeah. and very different places. Um but yeah, for for a lot of my time in Manchester, I've always had, I've always sort of gone over in my head what I would do, like, and ne- it never happens. Like, this has only been one case where someone has approached me, you know, could possibly going back on the tram after going to training, yeah, and nothing happens. But I've all, I've all, I always prepare these scripts just in case. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's really interesting. Um, so we've gone over... Oh, questions have gone off. There we go. Got them back. Uh, so what are the three most important lessons you've learnt at Chewy Gem? Um, that the customers are the most important people because without the customers, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing now. I absolutely love my job. I think it's very rare that somebody can say they love their job. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so without our customers, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing. Um, I've had to learn to try not to take things personally because I'm a people pleaser. So as a business, you can't please everybody. There's always going to be somebody that's disappointed with something. Um, And for a long time, I would take that personally. So it took me a long time to learn that lesson that, people aren't personally attacking you if they're not happy. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, sorry. sorry um, <laughs> <laughs> and just to believe in yourself because things get tough. And I think especially when you're autistic, you go into like the dark mode, I call it, and it feels so hard to climb back up to the light. You just feel so down yeah. at times. And so I try and be positive and remind myself that I'm doing this for a reason and that, if it's a bad time, it's going to get better. It always gets better. It's your meaning, your meaning, your meaning to life that sort of pulls you through the the difficulties. Yeah, would you yeah say? definitely. Well, that, those, those are some great, great lessons. I'm very, very um, pleased with those. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I do think that, yeah, I'm a, I'm a people pleaser as well. And I think you know for, throughout life and trying to make it in the media and media and stuff and talk about autism. I have learned that you know some people are just going to have off days and some people are just going to be a bit rude and not re- act in the same the way that you'd want. Yeah, them to. and I think that's that's the important thing. Sometimes I'll get a message from somebody and they're really irate because maybe their parcel hasn't turned up on time or it's turned up and it's missing something, and. I think to myself, what happens if I was having a really bad day and that was me? I would possibly yeah. react in that way. Whereas if I was having a good day, I might message and say, oh, I've got my parcel, but such and such is missing. 
but another day I'll, I'll be like right I expect a refund and and people do just have off days so you've got to respect that when somebody gets in touch mm-hmm. so I'll take a step back yeah. and view the reasons why they're like this rather than yeah and especially in our community because if it's a parent that's got an autistic child they maybe haven't slept for weeks you know so mm-hmm. it, it, it can be hard can be hard very difficult and um i'm gonna go on to the the last one so this is sort of a um a little question just uh exercise the brain muscles um you can answer in any way you want so it doesn't there's no set in stone answer it doesn't it's it's i'm not requiring anything but what does autism mean to you this is always a really difficult question isn't it it is because uh, it's so ambiguous <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's sometimes you need it just to get the get the cool answers yeah. that you don't expect uh, so <laughs> for me it's probably about seeing and experiencing the world differently uh because i didn't realize that i did that until i started going through my diagnosis um yeah. like i've said before I, I just assumed everybody saw things the same way as me so to now realize that i'm seeing things differently and that's quite cool mm-hmm. um gives you gives you a perspective doesn't yeah. it because you you can realize that the stuff that you struggle with it's not because you're like weak-willed or or anything like that it's because you experience life in an at an intensity that other people don't yeah, and i think it's important to remember that there's things that you struggle with but there's also things that you're really really good at and because you're coming from a different yes. angle to other yeah. people that makes you a really important person i think and we have a lot to offer Definitely. everybody in life a lot of unique ways of thinking about things a lot of skills hyper concentration a desire to learn every single nook, nook, nook and cranny of everything to do with our subject of interest yeah. and there's just so many people out there who are famous and have done great things that have aspects of autism and they you know whether it's explicitly known or whether yeah i think it's certain traits when you were on our podcast jenny asked you about who inspires you um and mm-hmm. i think you said Anne hegarty was one of those yes and i was thinking that like you won't know this but there'll be loads of people that i'm inspired by you who watch your youtube channel and i think that's awesome oh (laughs) i don't yeah but i I don't it's it's really hard to sort of get that into my head because it's uh when you get on youtube and social media and stuff a lot of it is to do with you're just looking at numbers usually and it can be it can be very difficult because even the more numbers that you get the more little each increment each step feels yeah, so I used to, <laughs> if that makes I used to sense. focus so much on numbers, page likes, and if if somebody disliked the page and things like that. And then, because we obviously we're, we're growing and we're growing, so we send out newsletters and things, and somebody might unsubscribe from a newsletter, and how many emails do you send per week? And then I thought, you know what, if if somebody wants the information, then they're the people like you want to be following you. And if you're yeah. helping them, then they, they'll stay with you. And the people mm-hmm. that leave... I mean, I think it's a bit different on YouTube. Do you get much negativity on YouTube? I, I it's it's hard to say whether it's negativity. Some t- I'll get like maybe a very low amount because it's because my channel is so small and the people who do follow me are very sort of you know behind yeah. me. Um, I don't get that much negativity, and sometimes a lot of the, the issues come from people making snap judgments yeah. about me and about what I do. I had this one guy who was who came on and said, oh, you're perpetuating all these people coming up and saying that they're autistic and stuff. And then th- little did he know, there was, a, there was a, a video on the back burner ready to go out on the day after about the benefits of getting a diagnosis. <laughs> yeah. I think like I've, I've heard quite a lot about people being trolled on YouTube in particular yeah. Um, it's like at Chewy Gem, it's a really positive community. There's very rarely mm-hmm. anything negative that's said. And if it is said, 
it's usually have a look at it from the perspective of have they had a bad day what's going on here and then we'll sort it out but yeah i think that's my uh, from what i've heard about youtube i've never i do put some videos on youtube but i would never really go on that platform because i'd be worried about negativity yeah oh, one thing that i have found is that aut the the autistic people who do post ne quite negative and harsh things they are extremely you know sort of they've got a silver tongue for that sentence and they, they craft these words of yeah are they, they they elaborate on it and explain each part of it but as as soon as you reply and you give them reasons for it and you you're nice with them then they're, then they're very receptive yeah. to it and there's been there's been some times where that someone has written a very long and for, drawn out and for, thought out comment about something. And then I've replied in a really nice way and they've been like, oh, you know what? Yeah, you're kind of right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to subscribe yeah. to you. And I think that's the key, isn't it? <laughs> to be nice. Because I'm the sort of person that if you've got nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, at least something constructive, yeah. at least. And th those are the things that, you know that I've picked up, and I think that's one of the the golden sort of things about autistic people is that if you make sense and you come across in a nice way and you're not condescending, then they'll be very receptive to it. And neurotypical people, from my experience, don't seem to have the same same sort of thing. Not everybody, of course, because I'm not. Everybody is different. Yeah. Everybody. But in general, that's that's the kind of thing that I've found. Um, so I think, yeah, we've just passed an hour. So uh, I think we'll round that up. Lorraine, thank you so much for coming on the 40 OT podcast. Have you enjoyed yourself? Yes, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been really great to talk to you. And let's uh, let's get out some social media links. So do you have any... Anything that you want people to follow or have a look at or do? Yeah, so we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram and Twitter, chewygem.co.uk is the website. But um, our sensory support group on Facebook is the place where we want people to go. That's where we chat amongst ourselves and that's the community that, that we're, we're trying to push. So it's not about the products. If you need the products, that's fine. But if you just want to come and join the Chewy Gem sensory support group, then it's a brilliant place just to meet other like-minded people. And um, of course, your podcast, Sensory yeah, Matters. Yeah, podcast, Sensory Matters. It goes out every Monday. You can find it on the page on um, Spotify, Stitcher, and on iTunes. But we post links on Instagram and Twitter and everything as well. Everything's on our website. Our website's fantastic because we've got a, a content hub. So you can search through there for blogs, podcasts, downloadables. So that's all on chewygem.co.uk. <laughs> And if you do have any questions, um, you are at the public rather. You guys, you guys listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you've got any questions for Lorraine, I've, I'm, am I right thinking that you'd be very happy to uh, receive some direct messages on Instagram or Twitter? Yeah, direct and... messages on any of our socials. Um, I'm, I'll be happy to respond. Brilliant. And if you want to go go and check out some of the stuff that I do. I live stream on Twitter. I post regular things to my Instagram and Facebook. They're all at Asperger's Growth if you want to go check those out. And of course, YouTube, Asperger's Growth. Go check out some of my videos on autism, mental health. You know, whether you've got problems, you're autistic yourself, you've got problems making friends, dating, mental health. I cover all of that stuff and... There's also a few videos that you can share with your friends or your community that help people really understand what it's about. If you have any ideas of what you want or who you want on the 40 OT podcast, maybe you want to be on yourself. You have some amazing story to do with autism and mental health. Please contact me. It's my email, aspergisgrowth at gmail.com. Let me just check that again because sometimes I'm a bit, muddle minded uh <laughs> come on tom
Yeah, aspergersgraph at gmail.com. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I hope you all have, are having a great day. I hope you're feeling bright and sunny and doing good. I'll see you on the next 40 Audi podcast. And Lorraine, again, thank you so much for Thanks coming for on. Thanks for having me. See you later, guys.